I know what all, you're all thinking. I know it. I need to retire. <laughs> you wouldn't be wrong. Okay. Um, here we go. Four pressures, yes? Yes. Here we go. What I want to do, though, is I want to explain those four pressures in the context of um, congestive heart failure, okay? So let's look at this. We can use this. Uh-oh, can't use that. We know that these four pressures are at the level of the capillary and the cell. We know this, right? The cell's kind of squished. <laughs> He's a tall and thin guy. And what are the two things that determine capillary osmotic pressure? Sodium and albumin. That's right. Sodium and big L, right? And remember, it's not the size, it's the number, correct? What primarily determines interstitial osmotic pressure? Oh, oh, that's right. Little tiny proteins in the interstitial space. Say yes. So capillary osmotic pressure, capillary osmotic pressure tends to draw water from the interstitial space by osmosis. Remember that osmotic pressure is the ability of stuff to draw water towards it, right? And then interstitial osmotic pressure, that tends to draw water towards the interstitial space by the osmotic effect of those small proteins in the interstitial space. Say yes. yes. Okay. Now, <coughs> at the level of the capillary, at the level of the capillary, you have, and there's fluid in the capillary, you have what's called capillary fluid pressure. Capillary fluid pressure. And capillary fluid pressure tends to force fluid by pressure out of the capillary and into the interstitial space. And what's the primary determinant of capillary fluid pressure? No, that's osmotic pressure. What determines capillary fluid pressure? I'm going to give you a hint. Systolic blood pressure. Say yes. Are you with me? Is there fluid in the interstitial space? Yeah. So that fluid that's in the interstitial space, that tends to force fluid out of the interstitial space and into the capillary. So that pressure is called interstitial fluid pressure. Tell me you're with me, guys. Now, if you add up those four pressures in normal physiology, the net movement is fluid out of the capillary and into the interstitial space. But what do we have in our body that drains excess fluid? The lymphatic system. So the lymphatic system will drain all of that excess fluid and send it back to the cardiovascular system. Say yes. yes. Okay. Now watch. What's the valve that separates the left uh, atria from the left ventricle? What is it? Right, it's the mitral valve. See, you thought I was saying the left atria from the pulmonary vein. See, you were tricked. Right? That's why you got to listen. So, watch. This is important. If the left ventricle begins to fail, then the amount of blood in the left ventricle is going to increase because the force of contraction of the left ventricle is failing. That means that blood that was in the left ventricle is going to start backing up into the left atrium. 
then it's going to start backing up into, well, there's the left atrium, into the pulmonary veins, the pulmonary venules, and the pulmonary capillaries. Say yes. yes. So what's going to happen is this. So this is an alveoli, and this is a pulmonary capillary. So as a result of fluid backing up into the pulmonary veins, venules, and capillaries, what's going to happen to capillary fluid pressure in the pulmonary capillaries? It's going to go up. And if it gets high enough, it is going to force fluid into the alveoli. Tell me... You got that. And that condition is called pulmonary edema. And if it gets bad enough, you get the death rattle and you gurgle to death. So people, when they die from the death rattle, they're basically drowning in their own blood plasma. That's how they die. Tell me you got that. All right. All right. I'm just going to mention this. You'll probably never remember it, but it'll come back. There's a setting on a ventilator called PEEP. Have you ever heard of it? No? PEEP. Yeah. For people with pulmonary edema, they can't breathe very well because they can't uh, exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide because their waters, their lungs are underwater essentially. They use this uh, uh, additional uh, ventilator setting called PEEP. So what they will do is once the person is intubated, they have the breathing tube into their trachea, they will take those marshmallow candies and push them down into their lungs. <coughs> That's PEEP. PEEP stands for positive end expiratory pressure. Essentially, what PEEP does is it will push fluid out of the alveoli. So the fluid, because the capillary fluid pressure in someone with CHF is greater and it's pushing fluid into the alveoli, you need an alternate force to try to push that fluid back into the capillary. That is called PEEP. You will see that. Tell me you got that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And I don't even have to go over this, right? We went over this. Is, am I right? Say yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those are the... <clears throat> four pressures. Tell me you got that. Alright, All right, so I did that. Do I, do I have to go over any more other than the fetal circulation? I've done every other question, correct? Yep. Okay, so it's fetal circulation time. You guys don't like this, huh? How many people looked at the fetal circulation video? I really like that. I just think this is so cool. And just so you know, when you get into clinical and you do your pediatric rotation, they love talking about congenital heart defects of the newborn. They love going over that stuff. So to understand fetal circulation, um, if you do, you'll understand the, the two most common heart defects of the newborn. There's probably some people in here right now that maybe have one of those defects. And it's no big deal, typically. All right, so here we go. All right. Just so you know, and I need to explain this. Watch. <clears throat> this is not the mother's circulation, and this is the baby. People thought this was the baby, which looks like a little pizza, <laughs> right? And this was a mother circulation. This is the placenta, 
You got me? And this is actually the fetal circulation. Tell me you got that. Okay. Tell me a couple of things a fetus doesn't do that you do. Read the textbook, did you say? Oh, breathe. Right. They, uh, a fetus, no breathing. Say, yeah. What else don't they do? Eat. No eating. What else? Come on. No pooping. Do they pee? Yes, they pee all the time. They're floating in pee. That's the amniotic fluid. They form amniotic fluid by peeing. Ee hee. Is that why if you have like excess amniotic fluid they test you for gestational diabetes? Uh I didn't know that. <laughs> do they do that? Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Oh, wow. I, yeah, I didn't know that. Look, I'm telling you right now, I don't know nothing about kids. I, I don't. I know fetal circulation that when a baby is born, they are obligatory nose breathers. They don't know they can breathe through their mouth. If you pinch off an infant's nose, they'll suffocate. And the only way they can clear their airway is by sneezing. They're not coordinated enough to dig in and get out a googie. <laughs> That's all I knew. And that their resting heart rate in a fetus, not a fetus, but a newborn is like 120 to 140. That's all I know. So, no, I didn't know that, but that makes perfect sense, right? Now, do, do you understand what she just said? No. If you have excessive amounts of amniotic fluid, they will test you for gestational diabetes. Why? Because if the mother's blood sugar is high, that is going to draw fluid out of her bloodstream, and that is going to cause more fluid to end up in the fetal circulation, and that will cause the little feti to pee more and make more amniotic fluid. Wow. Yeah. Did you have gestational diabetes? How big was your kid? Yeah, that's a good-sized kid. Does he read the textbook or she? Mm. Okay, so no, no breathing, no eating, no pooping. What else do they do? Not do. Watch videos? <laughs> they don't, well, okay. All right, watch. What's the most important part of fetal development? The nervous system. Say yes. You got me? So from the time that little feti is conceived, yes, the, the nervous system, the central nervous system and peripheral nervous system are developing. So what's the most important part of that baby to, that receives maximum oxygen delivery? The nervous system, tell me you got that. Now watch. Whoever thunked this up had it going on. The way the cardiovascular system is designed is it's designed to deliver maximum oxygen delivery to the central nervous system. Say yes. Okay. Now, a couple of things. For the most part, the only other parts of the fetus that are really metabolically active are the liver and the kidneys. The rest of the parts of the baby aren't doing too much. They're simply developing and growing. Say yeah. Yes. Right? So 
a couple of things. Number one, babies get jaundice, yes? Because of liver failure, right? Yes? yes. Watch. You better write this down. Fetal hemoglobin is different than people hemoglobin. Are you with me? Fetal hemoglobin, better write this down, better not pout. Fetal hemoglobin carries 30% more oxygen than regular adult hemoglobin. And I'll explain why in a minute. So when that baby pops out, do they slap the kid on the butt anymore? No. Why not? They just start crying? Yeah, I cried too. You had it good for nine months and now you come out in this cold, cruel world, all these expectations, <laughs> right? So anyway, you just slap the kid on the butt and the kid's like, <gasps> takes a breath, he's like, what the, right? What did I do? Anyways, so once they start breathing, right, the baby's little liver has got to get rid of all that fetal hemoglobin. Who's following this? I want this. So watch. Son of a bitch. Hang on. That took a while. Watch. How long do red blood cells live? That's the only thing you'll ever remember in any of these classes, right? And what's the uh, big protein inside a red blood cell? What is it called? What, what's it called? I heard somebody say it. Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. And what's in hemoglobin that oxygen binds to? I'm just telling you. There you go. So when a red blood cell dies, the red blood cell membrane is ruptured, and it reveals the hemoglobin. And the liver and the spleen, especially the liver and the little fetus, it breaks down the hemoglobin to heme and globin. Mm. Say yeah. yeah. The heme portion is broken down to what? Billy Rubin and iron. The globin portion goes to the liver and the amino acids are converted to glucose or fat. The bilirubin then goes to the liver, the little fetal liver, and that gets converted to bile. Tell me you got that. Sometimes that little fetus, when they destroy the fetal red blood cells, the little fetal liver will get overwhelmed. So that liver starts backing up bilirubin, and then it starts backing up into the blood and the tissues, and they get jaundice. So it's not because their liver's damaged. Sometimes they just get overwhelmed because you have to destroy all that fetal hemoglobin. And so what you do is you put them under a billy light, or the doctor will say, take them out into the sun for a, a little bit. The ultraviolet light, uh, light breaks down the bilirubin to urobilogen. It gets into the blood. They pee dark for a couple of days, and the kid is straight. Tell me you got that. Okay. All right. I'm going to go through this whole thing. Watch. Where are we? Here we go. The placenta is directly connected to the endometrial lining of the mother. The endometrial lining of the mother, the inner lining of the uterus, is extremely vascular. So the placenta develops, and they have a huge blood supply between the endometrial lining and the placental membrane. Know this. Maternal and fetal red blood cells never mix. 
It is only the plasma and the nutrients within that blood that actually is transferred to the baby. Now, in adults, the spleen and the bone marrow produce red blood cells. In a fetus, it's the liver that primi uh, primarily produces red blood cells. So watch. As the little capillary network in the placenta begins to move towards the umbilical vein, obviously the vessels get bigger. So you have one big umbilical vein that leaves the placenta and enters the baby through the belly button. Tell me you got that. All right. And have you ever seen an umbilical cord? How many people have their umbilical cord? Made like a belt out of it or something. Okay. Anyways, there's jelly inside that. And when the baby pops out, because it's not as warm as it was, it's always kind of cold in that delivery room, that wart and jelly will begin to expand and it will compress the umbilical artery and umbilical vein. So really clipping it, right, clamping it, you really don't need to. Physiologically, it takes care of itself pretty much. All right. Now remember, in the strictest of sense, a vessel that brings blood towards the heart is a vein, and a vessel that brings it away is an artery. So you have one big umbilical vein, and this umbilical vein carries blood that is high in oxygen. This is highly oxygenated blood. And remember that fetal hemoglobin carries 30% more oxygen because the baby's heart is actually circulating mixed blood, meaning it's going to mix with some deoxygenated blood, so it needs to be able to carry more oxygen. So here we go. So it goes through the little baby's belly button, and then the umbilical vein will branch off into the liver, where about upwards of 30% of that blood is diverted to the liver to grab some newly formed red blood cells and get rid of some old red blood cells. Then the umbilical vein will connect to the baby's inferior vena cava. And this is, again, an abnormal connection called the ductus venus. The ductus venus connects the baby's inferior vena cava with the umbilical vein. And the umbilical or the inferior vena cava, the fetus, is carrying deoxygenated blood. So this is where you get the mixing of highly oxygenated blood and deoxygenated blood. Who's following this? Guys? Okay. Now this is the unique thing. The uterus is made of muscle. So what it will do is it will rhythmically contract and produce like a heartbeat. And it will create pressure in the umbilical vein that causes this blood that's in the umbilical vein to be a high pressure stream. Who's following this? Guys? All right. And not shown in this video, there's like a little slide. It's actually like a little tunnel, like a little cone shape. So this is important. So this high pressure stream of blood that is entering the right atrium and it's highly oxygenated, this high pressure stream of blood will actually bypass the right side of the heart, the baby's right side of the heart, and this high pressure, highly oxygenated blood will go through this little cone-shaped tunnel and, please get this, Between the right atria and the left atria, there is a flap. This little flap that produces a hole is called the foramen ovale. The foramen ovale is a hole between the right and left atria. It is a hole that's supposed to be there. If a hole is supposed to be there, it's called a foramen. A gunshot wound to the head is not a foramen. It ain't supposed to be there. How many people follow this? So 
this high pressure stream of blood, this high pressure stream of blood that's coming in from the baby's inferior vena cava and through this little tunnel is going to bypass the baby's right heart and go into the left atrium through that foramen ovale. Who's following this? Guys, who's got this? So now you have this blood that's highly oxygenated in the left atria. And normal circulation ensues. Mitral valve, left ventricle. Left ventricle contracts and it sends it through the aorta. What are the three big vessels that come off the arch of the aorta? The very good. Brachiocephalic trunk, left common carotid, left subclavian. And those three arteries supply highly oxygenated blood to the brain and central nervous system. It makes perfect sense. Say yes. yes. Now watch. Do you have to return that venous blood from the upper part of the body? Of course you do. So that venous blood is going to return through the superior vena cava, enter the right atrium, but this is a low pressure stream. So this low pressure stream of blood is going to go through normal circulation, right atria, tricuspid valve, right ventricle. Now, better get this. Better be in your answer. Okay, here we go. Watch. When the right ventricle contracts, is the baby breathing when it's inside the womb? No. So, watch. Ready? If the baby isn't breathing, there's going to be low levels of oxygen in the alveoli. And low levels of oxygen in the alveoli cause the pulmonary arterioles to what? Vasoconstrict or dilate? Vasoconstrict. So watch. All of the pulmonary vessels are going to be constricted because the baby's not breathing. So is any blood going to be going through the pulmonary circulation? No. no. So watch. There is a connection between the pulmonary trunk and the descending aorta. That connection between the pulmonary trunk and the descending aorta is called the ductus arteriosus. The ductus arteriosus connects the pulmonary trunk to the descending aorta, and it remains patent, it remains open by the mother producing a chemical called prostaglandins. Prostaglandins circulate through the baby's circulation and keep that ductus arteriosus open or patent. Where does blood always go? The path of least resistance. So because of the baby not breathing, hey, the pulmonary vessels are constricted. The mother is exposing the baby to prostaglandin, so that's going to dilate that ductus arteriosus. So when the right ventricle contracts, it's going to send that blood not to the lungs, but through the ductus arteriosus, and that highly oxygenated blood in the ascending aorta is going to mix with the blood from the right ventricle that is now connected to the descending aorta, and it's going to feed the rest of the baby's body. Tell me you got that. Then you have the two internal iliac arteries, and they will connect the two umbilical arteries. And that will remove the metabolic waste from the baby. It will go back towards the placenta. Nutrients and gases are exchanged, and the circulation continues. Tell me yes. Okay, here we go. Watch. Now what happens? The kid pops out. You clamp the cord, you smack his ass, he takes a big deep breath, 
right? When the kid takes a big deep breath, what is he putting into his alveoli? Oxygen. So now oxygen's in the alveoli, so all of these pulmonary vessels that used to be constricted will now dilate. So they will get bigger. And by cutting the cord, right, what's the baby no longer exposed to? Prostaglandins. So the ductus arteriosus will close. It will begin to close. Tell me you're following this. So watch, was a lot of blood, was all the blood coming into the left atria? No, because a lot of that blood was being diverted through the ductus arteriosus. Are you following me? If you recall, I explained to you that that little opening between the left and right atria is actually a flap, right? So you have the right atria, then you got the left atria. Now, remember, now the baby's breathing. All of that blood now is going to the lungs. And it's going to participate in gas exchange. Say yes. And all of that blood now is going to come back to the left atrium where some of it was being bypassed into the descending aorta. So the left atrial pressure is going to start to build up. And that will slap that little flap shut. So the ductus arteriosus begins to close by virtue of no longer being exposed to prostaglandins. And the foramenal valley closes by virtue of now the baby breathing and you sent the little baby circulation sending that blood to get oxygenated in the lungs, say yes. Okay. All right. See if you watch the video. What does your belly button become? Like, what, is, what happens to your umbilical cord after you don't need it no more? <laughs> what? No, the, no. What, what happens to the, 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 the vessels underneath? It becomes becomes licorice. And if you dig in there, you can have some licorice. This becomes the round ligament of the liver. And then the ductus venous becomes the ligamentus uh, ve venosus. I can't remember. No, Who cares? No. That wasn't on the video? Not at all. So what? So what? It's in the book. <laughs> Yeah, don't read that. Don't read that. Yeah. How many people got that? Mm -hmm. All right, watch. I don't know if this is in the video or not. So what are the two most common heart defects of the newborn? PDA. What? PDA. Right. Patent or patent. Patent means open. You got them? Got Got <laughs> You got them? So if the PDA remains open, then you have patent ductus arteriosus. The other one is the hole between the two atria, right? And that's called patent foramen ovale. You probably heard of it as atrial septal defect. Have you heard of that? That's atrial septal defect. And then if you take my pathophysiology class, I'll... Uh, I'll teach you about the congenital heart defects of the newborn. And I'm sure you'll just take that class just for that. <laughs> Tell me you got that. All right, watch. There's really two ways to treat patent ductus arteriosus. What keeps it open? What keeps it open? Prostaglandins. Watch. Prostaglandins are involved in inflammation. So when you twist your ankle, you take ibuprofen. Say yes. So there's a drug out there called Indocin. And that is given to 
little babies IV to prevent the synthesis of prostaglandins to increase the time that it takes that ductus arteriosus to close off. If that doesn't work, then what they do is they go in there with a hefty tie and they just tie it off. Tell me you got that. Now watch. If you have an atrial septal defect, there's a little hole between the right and left atria. What they'll do is they'll take a little piece of rubber from a bike tire, cut it, the surgeon elicits it, and then just slaps it right in there. <laughs> what they do is they put a, like a Dacron graft in there, and they use a catheter to place it, and then the body will say, what the hell is this? And it will put scar tissue over it, and that's how it seals. Say, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. That is fetal circulation. Don't you think that's cool? No, you don't. Okay, go take a break. Don't you don't think that was cool, huh? It ain't that bad. You should have seen when I when I had to learn this. Yeah, nobody cares, right? I don't even care. I'm over here talking to myself. I'll have to ask him. Okay, well, I can't help you. You don't have any knowledge. Yeah, well, what kind of food does he like? Uh, let's see. Like, probably Italian. Are you trying to keep it, like, Nuda's cheap? cheap? Or, like, No, I'm going nice. to take him somewhere nice, you know. Nuda's in Milwaukee is really good. They do. Is it? It's my favorite Italian place in Milwaukee. I got to take my, I'm taking my buddy, too. Yeah. You know what's really overrated? Hobnob. I know. It's so expensive. I can't believe it. I took my girlfriend, her son, her daughter, her granddaughter, and my son there, right? Spent 560 bucks. And then, like, we had to wait, and then I'm like, you're kidding me. You're kidding. Well, prime rib, but it's kind of hard to screw up prime rib. I mean, let's be honest. Right? But I'm like, I couldn't believe it. Then manjas in Kenosha. I'm in Chicago and I'm talking to these people. Oh, I love that place. I love that place. So I take my girl there for her birthday, right? And I was so disappointed. You know? I don't like it. You know what I used to really love is Taco Del Rey. Loved it, but then now their chicken burritos have gotten smaller. That that food was so good. Like that was my big thing, man. Right? Like I I was working in Milwaukee and I come to see my mom and I'm like. Stopping at Tacos El Rey, <laughs> right? That was like, yeah. Hey, do they still serve at McDonald's those frozen yogurt cones? God, those are so good. Like, I like the chocolate vanilla swirl. Oh, you mean like just like cups? No, they were in like a cone. I'd have to get my mom one. They don't know they They still are. They are. I haven't had one of those in a while. <laughs> Did I answer all the questions? Okay. There'll be like 10 questions. Uh, this is going to be, uh, there's going to be uh, uh, like three questions for extra credit, too. I get it. I get it. I'm not a monster. Then what's the point of going over it? Because you're going to go, oh, you know what? Even though this isn't going to be on there, I'm going to study it. No, you won't. <laughs>
What? No. What does that mean? I tell, I give you the freaking questions and teach you the answer. What more you want? You need to write it out for you? I'll give you one. It's going to be the coronary artery disease one. What do you mean, which one? There's two of them. Lord. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Someone better, Dana, can you email me and remind me? <laughs> yeah, and you know what? And then people yell, uh, right? Tim, I thought the cell was going to be on that quiz. <laughs> Guys, kill me. You know what I'm going to really do? I'm going to be unfair one time and put a question on there that I didn't even go over. That's unfair. Do you understand that? You can say a lot of things about me, but unfair is not one of them. Yeah? Okay, get out your phones. Well, they're probably already out. They're probably on fire. <laughs> I stayed up late last night working on this Kahoot. I did. Has everybody got a phone? <laughs> Man, that was a good one. That's how all my are. You missed the one where I actually threw my phone earlier. Hmm. Okay. All right. Does anybody have, like, any quaaludes or anything? And then you could take them and look at this fetal circulation. I think something could happen. <laughs> Do people take quaaludes anymore? You know what the big drug is now? Heroin. Do you know why they put them in ice when they overdose? Yeah. Why? Right, because increased body temperature increases the rate of diffusion and metabolism of the drug. The education of Gateway Technical College students continues. All right, hang on. Where are we? Okay, what did I say? Who? How much does the winner get? A hundred. Oh. A hundred. Uh -huh. Yeah. Aren't you being generous? Okay, well, I'm, nah, I'm no, not going to be I'm generous. sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Just say that. Oh, jeez, I'm sorry. You guys will complain if a brand new truck landed over Oh, yeah. crud. <laughs> I'm not editing it. This class is like Vegas. You got me? <laughs> what the hell is that? Oh. Okay, here we go.
Do I have to hit start? Do I have to hit start? Yeah. Oh. I didn't before. Or did I? Wait a minute. Doesn't it go automatically? Oh, wait a minute. How does that? I'm have to have two questions right there. Okay. Uh, let's see. Alright, that should be good, right? Okay. You're going to have to do it again. Sorry. Okay, is everybody in? No. Well. Oh, uh, uh. So, should we just start over? Yeah. We can start the respiratory system if you want. Okay. Do you want to? <laughs> no, okay. All right, so there's a learning curve associated with this, and don't give, be all up in my grill. <laughs> don't be all <laughs> Okay, wait. should give you a new number to so rejoin it. Oh, it doesn't. Boy, it was incredible how fast you answered that. <laughs> Thank you.
right atria, right ventricle. I get people. I know. Do that to decrease preload.
diuretics affect the <coughs> blood, blood volume. him to hundred times more per meal. That was a tough one. causes depolarization.
closes within a couple of days, right? It's hypokalemia. It's potassium supplements. You bet your head. right?
remember it's arrhythmia that kills you. Massive arterial vasodilation, massive arterial vasoconstriction. They only let you type so many words. umbilical vein.
good one. False, because calcium uh, you rely on calcium inside the muscle, so it won't. Otherwise, you'd be paralyzed. fatty acid pain all the time. <laughs> that should have been the right answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, it, that's Heather, right? Yep. Heather and then Callie. And who was the funny face? Okay. So it's, uh, listen up, uh, 175, 50, and then 20. You got me? If you don't put it down, you're not getting it. That's the new rule because I can't remember. Say yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, we'll leave it there today. We're done with the cardiovascular system. Listen up because this is true. If you're, guys, if you're going to.